At this point, you should be ready to run GUI core for the first time. If you are on Mac and you executed the X attribute command as specified in the PDF, the program should start, but may give you a warning about accessing your documents directory. Go ahead and say it's OK. That's where we're saving the files. On Windows, when you double click it, it will tell you that Windows is protecting your PC, but we want to run it anyway, so go ahead and run. We'll now have a blank window, and we're going to build our first patch. This will be a pitch shifter that will go plus minus one octave. Now, of course, we have our libraries here, and we have a whole bunch of different things in them. So, in order to help you so that you can find what you need, when a library is read in, the description elements in it are added to this block directory. You just push this over here, and as you can see, when you click on it, everything in the library is listed, and when you click on each item, you're given the description, the description of the pins, and any parameters. So, for a pitch shifter, we need a pitch shifting block, which is in our GDSP library, and is right here at the top, pitch underscore RMP0, which simply is telling us that it's a plus minus one octave pitch shifter, and it is using ramp zero. It has three pins that are listed here. This particular block doesn't have any parameters. Parameters are setting to a block that are not pins, but something a block may need to know, such as a sample rate or something like that. We'll hit up a block later in the examples that uses parameters. But for now, we're just going to build a pitch shifter. But before we do that, we want to make sure that GUI core is properly configured. If you used the instructions in the PDFs, it should all be done. So we just need to look at files and edit configuration. All these file paths defaults should match what it said in the documents. So if you did exactly what the documents said, these should all be fine as is. The only thing you'll need to do is if you have a dev board or an ICP board connected into a product, that you have this selected at the top here. And if you've changed the I2C address to the FX core, you'll want to change it here. Dev boards by default are hex address 30, but if you've changed it or you're plugging into your own product with an ICP, you may need to change this. If everything looks good, just hit OK, and that will actually write a config file into your documents directory. So now, building the pitch shifter is pretty straightforward. We can grab the pitch block right from the DSP library, and now we need to connect inputs and outputs. As we can see, there are three pins on it that are also marked here. So this top one is the input, this next one is the control pin, this one here to the right is the output. We'll be able to tell that when we're in net mode, if we put the mouse over a pin, if you notice at the bottom of the screen, it then tells us what pin we're on. So obviously this top one is in, this is, S, this is shift, which is the control, and this is output. Go back to device mode. And the difference here is device mode is for moving blocks around, grabbing them from the library and stuff. Net mode is for interconnecting the blocks. Just found it easier to operate in two different modes than trying to run everything all the time off of mouse position. So now we need to grab some more blocks. Obviously we need input, output, and controls. So that would be here in the SFR blocks. But before we do that, one of the things that we typically do with blocks is that all these pins are MREG types, as is noted here. That makes it easy to connect blocks together. But to go to an SFR, we need a way to convert from an MREG to a special function register. We have two blocks for that in the utility library. Get SFR, put SFR. Get SFR gets an SFR value in and outputs it as an MREG type. So we need two of those one for our signal, one for the pot, and then we need one put SFR to go from the pitch shifter to the out zero. So now we can add in in zero. We're going to use pot zero 
smooth the value for controlling the pitch shifter. And we're going to output on out zero. Switch modes to net. Now there are also keyboard shortcuts. So like control T will switch, will toggle back and forth between device and net mode. On a Mac, that would be Command T. So anything that says Control here in the Windows example, it would just be Command on a Mac. We just put the cursor over, click and drag to create the net from one block to the next. Oops, I missed that pin. There we are. And that's it. We now have a pitch shifter. So we are going to save this. And we'll just call it pitch.gcf and save it. And now you'd be able to load it back in again at a later time. And now we're going to actually run it on our board. So we go File, Generate Code, Run from RAM. Now it's going to ask us to s save the FXC file. That is the first stage of assembly. This actually is all the library calls, which will then get expanded by the preprocessor to actual FX core code, which would then go through the assembler for writing to the board. We'll get to the, a little more detail on that. But for now, just hit save. And now it's running from RAM. So if you're listening to your board, you should be able to hear the pitch shifter going and use pot zero to go from negative one octave to positive one octave. When you're done with that, just hit OK and the board will stop running the program. It's that simple to build and run a program. So now we're actually going to load in one of the example programs we included. In this case, we're going to open the ring modulator. Now you can see the ring modulator uses a number of more blocks. In this case, we have, you know, in, get the SFR, but we also have the LFO block, some scaling blocks, a multiplier, a mixing block. All of these obviously exist in libraries, and you can look them up using the block directory. For instance, the 2mix right here tells you what it's doing, and it's right here. The LFO block does have some parameters, so make sure we're in device mode. Go over the LFO block and right-click. And as you can see, we've got four parameters to set. The first one, our minimum frequency that we want the LFO to make, and here it's, we've made it 1 hertz. Maximum frequency, 1500 hertz. The sample rate the board's running at, in my case, mine's running at 32k. Switch shift actually ref means the lower switch number we're going to use. LFO requires two switches that are next to each other in order to select which waveform you want. It can generate a sine wave, triangle, ramp, or square. So with a zero here, that means we're going to use switches zero and one. If we put a one here, it'd be switches one and two. So just leave this all for now, as is. Uh, you can hit OK or Cancel, it doesn't really matter. This Select block is being used to select between these two scale shifters. What this is doing is that if you run a ring modulate at a really low LFO, it'll sound more like a tremolo. And at a higher rate, it'll sound like the classic ring modulator. So this Select block allows us to select whether we want to run it at a lower or higher rate. In this case, we're using switch 2 to select which one of these we want, which then runs into the LFO. So again, all we need to do to run this on the board is to hit File, Generate FX Core Code, save the FXC, it'll assemble it, and download it to the board, and it's now running. So pot 1 will adjust our mix from 0% dry, 100% wet, to 100% dry, 0% wet. And pot 
0 will adjust the speed of the LFO and switch 2 will select whether we're on high or low speed and switches 0 and 1 will select the waveform. So you get a lot of selection with this block. However, what would be nice is to have some feedback. Right now we can hear it, but we can't see anything. So we're going to add a flashing LED. Now there are two LED flashers that we've included in the library, Flash LED and Flash LED 01. The difference is, is that this first Flash LED is designed to take a signal that goes negative 1, positive 1, whereas 01 is designed for signals that range between 0 and 1. The LFO block outputs a plus minus 1 signal, so we want the Flash LED block. So from libraries GUtil, we'll grab Flash LED, put it here. Now the Flash LED block requires a uh, MREG to hold our brightness value. So let's grab an MREG. We're already using MREGs 0, 1, and 2, so we're going to grab MREG 3. Then we're going to want it to flash user 0. So we go up here and user 0 is considered a constant. That's because user bits are not directly written to, they're written through a masking using the set uh, instruction. If you are using an old version of our uh, GUI core and our library, you may have seen an error if you try to load in an existing file that used user 0. That's because user 0 was originally put into the SFR blocks, but once we created the constant blocks as a default library, it got moved there because that's really where it uh, should be. So if you have any errors, just delete your flashing LED block and your user block and then re-add them. And that's because the flash LED blocks also changed uh, in order to work with a constant block. Now let's wire this up. Well, our input is going to come from our LFO. So let's just drag that over. We need this to go to the MREG that uses the brightness. And then this connects to user 0. So let's save this now and do the generate code run from RAM. And now you should see user 0 LED flashing and as you adjust pot 0 it'll slow down and speed up. Now if you have switch 2 set for the high rate you may see an unusual thing and that's where the LED is at first flashing fast and as you increase the frequency it actually seems to slow down. That is actually a visual representation of aliasing. When we flash this LED, we are actually sampling the LFO value, adjusting the brightness accordingly, and then essentially pulse width modulating the LED to have different levels of brightness. But if the LE LFO is moving a lot faster than we're sampling the value, we are actually going to alias, and while we'll hear a high frequency, we will see a lower frequency. This is similar to what goes on in an aliaser or decimator and bit cruncher, which that program also is here as a demo. So once you're done with this, just hit OK. The board will stop, the LED will stop flashing, and we'll be back here. So there is a number of sample programs we've included. This is this first one here, DeciCrunch is actually a decimator and bit cruncher. So this will do aliasing and bit crunching. We have a flanger, the pitch that we just built, two reverb examples, the ring modulator, and a tap tempo uh, delay that has adjustable feed, uh, feedback. Now, one of the things I mentioned is that you can edit files after they've been created. So as an example, if we look here in the directory where I have my FX Core programs that we've been running, we'll see that like with the pitch that we created, we created pitch.gcf, 
we saved pitch.fxc but now we see there are some other program uh, files in here so let's open those up and we can do that using notepad plus plus now this is really for more advanced users who want to customize the code after it's been generated So let's see here. We'll take a look at first at pitch.fxc. That was the one we saved from GUI core. And this is what it is. We can see the various blocks we use, get SFR, and the uh, ramp, and the put SFR. Things like the in and out blocks, you don't see explicitly as blocks because those are special function registers. They're just here in a graphical representation to make it easy to see. Now, when we did the run from RAM button, it actually ran the preprocessor and the assembler. So this code went into the preprocessor, and the output of the preprocessor was pitch.fxo, which is the actual code for the FX core. That was then run through the assembler and loaded into the board so that you could hear it. This code comes from the libraries. Now, advanced users, you can actually just write your own libraries and include them in the library directory in here and give it an FXL extension. It will get read in. All the libraries are in an XML format, so it's easy enough to open and edit and see the format. It's also gone over in more detail in the PDF about the tools. But you can see we actually have the code blocks. These are what go in. The parameters and pins as to their names. They get translated over. And it's actually possible to create your own custom libraries for your own products. And that's the basic introduction. Um, for most people that just want to play with things, you'll just use the existing libraries or people may share their libraries that you can then include. More advanced users, you can build your own libraries or edit the code after the fact, uh, like in Notepad++, which can then also run the code on your board. And if there's any questions, post them up in our form and I'll do my best to address them. Happy coding!